And here we are for part number two, uh, picking up with physical attraction. There we go. And so physical attraction is one of the major drivers in interpersonal relationships after propinquity or proximity. Uh, that is uh, what usually gets the ball rolling with physical, with uh, you know, interpersonal relationships. First, you have to be around somebody, so the proximity. Then you begin to like them more, uh, and then uh, other effects such as how physically attractive they are will also either increase or decrease your liking of them. And when we talk about physical attractiveness, we're talking about the combination of characteristics that are evaluated as beautiful or handsome or pretty at the positive extreme and unattractive and ugh <laughs> at the negative uh, extreme. And again, this is an important factor in interpersonal attraction. Uh, you know, after propinquity, uh, then other things such as physical attractiveness and also attitude similarity, which I hope you read in the book, are the other things that will either cement a relationship more deeply or keep it from cementing at a deeper level. So I'd like to talk about the major issues in physical attractiveness. And the first is face attractiveness, that is what makes a face attractive. And we've already heard a little bit about this from uh, Chen's Uncanny Valley article, but let's go back to the original source, which is Cunningham in 1986. And in this study, Cunningham looked at 75 male undergraduate intro psych students. Uh, and he showed them 50 black and white photos of women. Uh, they're all women. 23 were from college yearbook photos. Uh, however, uh, they were from the college yearbook before any of the male students came uh, to college. So it's not somebody they would know personally. And then the other more or less half were from the Miss Universe yearbook. And overall, the photos, uh, the 50 photos were mainly white women, European American women. There are seven black and six Asian women in the uh, packet. All that the men did uh, in the first experiment was to rate on a one to six scale the women from most to least attractive. Uh, that's all the subjects had to do. Then Cunningham, what he did was he used a uh, micron uh, measuring device, which is, allows you to measure things to very, very uh, small tolerances. Uh, he was able to measure things uh, down to uh, 0.05 millimeters, which is incredibly small. And he took the micron uh, to the uh, uh, photos and he measured different aspects of the faces of the photos. And this is just an illustration. Let me take you to a larger version. So he would measure, for example, the distance from the center of the eye to the top of the head. Uh, he would measure the width of the mouth. Uh, he would measure uh, you know, things such as from the bottom of the mouth to the bottom of the chin. Uh, the distance between the eyes. And what he did then was he looked at the ratings of physical attractiveness the men gave and he used statistical procedures to sort out uh, which measures were related to uh, the uh, male's ratings of physical attractiveness. And when he did this, he found that there were three factors or three groups of features uh, that uh, were related to the ratings of attractiveness. The first he called neonatal feature, features. And these were neonatal, uh, you know, neonatal means baby-like features. These are baby-like features such as larger eyes, smaller nose, smaller chin. Women with these characteristics were seen as more beautiful. Uh, then another factor that popped out was uh, what he called mature cheekbones, which was women with prominent cheekbones and narrow cheeks. And then uh, there were uh, a third factor of expressive features, uh, which included things such as high eyebrows, large pupils, and a large smile.
And so these were the three factors that Cunningham found were correlated with the ratings of attractiveness. Uh, the more that a woman had larger eyes, where's my pen? Larger eyes, smaller nose, smaller chin, the more mature cheekbones they had, and the more expressive features, uh, then uh, the woman was seen as more beautiful. Why? Uh, Cunningham, uh, you know, interpreted the results through evolutionary psychology. Uh, first off, neonatal or baby-like features uh, may elicit a caretaker response, but it would also uh, convey some type of uh, information about youth and possibly health and fertility. Uh, and so, according to evolutionary psychology, the neonatal characteristics of the women's faces were attractive because they had some type of effect on caretaker responses or some type of effect on the evaluation of the youth health and fertility of the woman. The expressive eyebrows, or excuse me, the expressive features were all associated with, uh, you know, expressions which noted interest in another person. So, for example, when we're interested in something, anything, uh, even a person or including a person, we raise our eyebrows when we're interested. We do this naturally without noticing it. And so a woman with naturally high eyebrows, resting high eyebrows, would be uh, considered to be interested in you, even though they're not really. And so that would make them more attractive. Likewise, larger pupils, our pupils dilate uh, when we're interested in something we're looking at. And so if you see somebody and even implicitly recognize that uh, they have dilated uh, pupils, you know that they might be interested in you. And a smile, people smile when they're interested or happy with meeting somebody. Mature cheekbones, uh, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, Cunningham was like, eh, I don't know. But you, know, you could build the argument that uh, while neonatal features may give information to youth and health, uh, you would need to have some type of mature feature to signal fertility. That is, that the woman is old enough uh, to actually become pregnant. So uh, from evolutionary theory, you might be able to build an argument, but it's not as strong as the other ones. In a second study, Cunningham also asked participants to rate not just the attractiveness, but also reproductive attributes of uh, the women. So he asked them about whether or not you felt the woman would have few or many medical problems. And so as a subject in this experiment, you're a guy, you look at a picture of a woman on a scale from one to six, rate how attractive this woman is, five. On a scale from one to six, rate how many uh, you know, medical problems she'll have over her lifetime, one to six. Uh, rate how fertile she looks, and that sounds pretty weird, question to ask, but the subjects did. And then also, ask how likely the woman would be to, uh, to have an affair on a spouse. And it's very odd, really. You're looking at a picture of a woman, and you're asking her to rate how unfaithful or faithful she would be to her husband. But what he found was that, again, those three factors of facial features were correlated with ratings of attractiveness and also correlated with ratings of uh, reproduction fitness. That is, women who have these uh, facial features, uh, the neonatal, the mature uh, you know, uh, cheekbones, and the expressive features, they were rated as having fewer or would be having fewer med uh, medical problems during their lifetimes. They were rated as more fertile uh, and more likely to have a child, and they would be rated as less likely to have an affair. And all of these are positive attributes when you're talking about reproductive bio biology and psychology. In that, uh, and we'll get into this more next week in our lecture, uh, that is, uh, you uh, men are attracted to and are seeking out female partners which are 
fertile, which are likely to be healthy enough to have a child, and also which is who are less likely to have an affair, so that you know that your children, that the children you think you're, that the children that you think are your children are actually your children. Those are all positives in terms of evolutionary psychology and reproductive fitness. And so what Cunningham found was that uh, what makes faces attractive really does fall out into these basic evolutionary psychology patterns. Uh, and as we got a taste in the Chen article, uh, there are some cross-cultural differences. Uh, that is, different societies have different, uh, you know, takes on these, but there is general universal agreement about the basic, neonatal features, expressive features, and mature cheekbones. And Barry and MacArthur, a uh, year earlier than Cunningham's study, found similar correlations between women's ratings of men's facial features uh, and men's facial attractive and men's facial attractiveness. So uh, there is a similarity in terms of what women are seeing as attractive in men. And let's get back to rating me or ranking me uh, and to illustrate another point in what makes a face attractive. Uh, these three faces, uh, the one on the left, the one on the center, or the one on the right, which one do you uh, find the most attractive? They're not all the same. So take a second to identify who you think is the most attractive. And this one, the one on the left, is the correct uh, image of myself. This and this are composites. And I've built these composites by just taking the right side of my face and uh, copying it and then flipping it over and then laying it down here on the uh, left side of my face. Or I've taken the left side of my face, copied it, flipped it over, and laid it down here. And one thing that we can see, cleaning us up oh, just a second, there we go, is that you'll notice, uh, notice my smiles here. No, I didn't want you to do that. I wanted my pen back. There we go. My smiles here and here are very symmetrical, but you notice that my smile here is a little bit asymmetrical, a little bit crooked. Uh, and also you'll notice that there's a slight uh, difference in how I'm holding my face uh, up around here. And this illustrates, because I know I don't like this image of myself. I prefer one of these. And most students prefer the middle one or the right one. And it comes back down to basic evolutionary psychology. Uh, symmetry is a cue to general health and also genetic health. That is, symmetry in the face and body is seen as more attractive. And this, again, is another cross-cultural or universal uh, you know, uh, phenomenon. Uh, and even though some people have slight differences in facial symmetry, symmetry is a marker for genetic damage and disease. And so we prefer people who are more sym sym symmetrically looking in terms of their face and body uh, because it's an indication that this person is likely to be disease free and also this person is likely to have healthy genes and of course that becomes important when you're talking about reproductive strategy and when we're talking about reproductive strategy and uh, you know how that you know relates to behavior then we're talking about evolutionary psychology so again uh, uh, symmetry and facial features and body features is seen as more attractive and you know, while some people have minor uh, you know differences in symmetry uh, the closer you are to symmetrical the more you're seen as uh, attractive and this is because uh, symmetry is a marker or a cue for uh, you know physical illness or genetic damage 
Oh, and we're done here. Now we'll move on to, in the next lecture, part three, symmet uh, not symmetrical bodies, but bodies, and what makes a beautiful body.